This week, the club gets into Faithless number one and Fair Lady number one. And I give Budget King a denim doorbell. Ooh, I can't wait. Tune in to find out what the fuck that is. Thanks for coming back to First Issue Club. We are your weekly comic book podcast that talks almost exclusively First Issue comic books. I'm Mike D. With me, as always, are Greg and the nasty little Budget King. Hey, I'm guys. I'm back. <laughs> Again, you didn't go anywhere. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm here. There we go. Very cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, before we get into our first issues this week, yes. uh, got some news. On my little Rotten Tomatoes app, mm-hmm. the tomato meter is extremely low for Hellboy. How low the is it? The are coming in. It's at 9% so far. Ooh. Ouch. Yikes, yikes, yikes. That's Geely bad. Yep. I actually think Geely was better <laughs> as far as ratings go. So what do you think about the initial reviewers coming in? Are they going to be trolls or are these like professional reviewers? Well, I think Rotten Tomatoes, after their fiasco with Star Wars movies, Captain Marvel, Shazam, have kind of figured out a way to weed out those fake film critics that are just rating a movie poorly to bring the score down so no one will see it based on whatever agenda they want to push. And I think that's good. So I think these are genuine getting paid to do reviews reviewers, and that's not very good for Hellboy. So Hellboy is agendaless. They're not, they're not pushing, oh, you know, women are equal or women can be leading roles, just that devils can save your planet. Um, yeah, and if that's an agenda, I mean, <laughs> push it. Push it real good. All the, day long. The trolls are, of course, fine with Satan being a hero. <laughs> of course. <laughs> that's one thing we have in common with trolls, I guess. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, So one thing I wanted to ask you guys about, like, comic book movies and what makes them good or bad right um how important is it to you that the movie stay faithful and true to the comic book does that counter into your review of a movie at all i will respect it as its own art form if it justifies it because marvel does a good job with this i'm never sitting in marvel being like oh when did that happen and which series of like which book marvel movies altogether kind of just they don't really worry about that. To go off that point, Marvel has kind of done their own thing where they're just like, listen, it's based off the source material that you've all grown to love and appreciate, but we're going to put our own movie twist on it because the comic books are a fucking lot to handle. There's so many details. There's so many backstories that they can't cover in a movie, so they have to just take a shortcut, and we as the audience and as we as the comic book fan audience has to be okay with that. Do you think the first time a character shows up in a movie, those are like the harshest criticisms of it being by the book or not? Maybe. I Like, for instance, I thought Watchmen, the movie, was was god-awful. Yeah. Um, still haven't seen it. Are you kidding? Really? <laughs> yeah. Still, wow. I, I can't yeah, I believe know. that. I know. I know. I know. And I, so, oh, sorry. Jeez. <laughs> Touchy in, subject. In some ways, and I can't name a movie that I like of his, but I, I like Scott. the idea of Scott Snyder. Yep. I like hyper-violence, I guess. Uh, 300? Besides that. What else is there that was great? Um, he gets a lot of movies for not having a lot of good movies, to be honest. <laughs> I would kind of agree with that. <laughs> yeah. But he's definitely one of the people who tries to respect the source material. Mm-hmm. Like, he's had a real hard-on for trying to do just, like, shot-for-shots reenactments of the panels from Watchmen. Oh, that 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 is true. That but, was really But does good. that work against him? Probably. I mean, it might hinder the movie. Well, when if you're you going to do that, that why change the fucking ending, then? That, I think that's where people get upset because if you set them up for a panel for panel reshot yeah. and then fuck up the ending, yeah. people are going to get mad. People like that movie, though. I think we're on the wrong side of history on that. I think that movie came out on the other end and people liked it. I enjoyed it. I, I for one, thought that it was going to be impossible to cram that graphic novel into yeah. something that's two hours long, which I think is a problem with a lot of the movies or a lot of the reviewers of the movies yeah. is that you expect, like, decades of fandom or like a whole two years worth of comic books to pay off in a singular movie and you can't do that now marvel gets more of a pass because they've got 20 years of movies that they're building us up for rather than these little one-off things that get judged more harshly i think anyway i think it's harder for a new comic book series to break on the scene but once you've gotten that plot line going with other characters people are much more forgiving with the sequels 
What's the source material that you guys were super pumped on or early on before it was a movie and then you viewed the movie, the movie of it? So I was really intrigued when Netflix said they were going to do the Umbrella Academy. And we talked about it in a few episodes earlier on. They stayed as true as they possibly could to the source material and then just fucking nailed it. Yeah. They may have tweaked a few things for storytelling as to depict it on TV, but they stayed really true to it and the fans and non-fans uh, are, are clamoring for it. It just got greenlit for a season two. So, Whew. what about you? Mine's not actually a comic book. I read Lord of the Rings before it came became a movie. Yeah. And I kind of had this epiphany where I was like, I didn't really actually enjoy reading it. And I like the movies way better. And Lord of the Rings is kind of a shit entity in and of itself. Yeah, you... Okay, so you've read them all, read, but you hate them. Uh, read them all... Is it like a hate read for you? Twice. It just was like the Why time... would you read something you hate twice? I think I was confused. Like, I didn't really have access to good fantasy uh-huh. when I was, like, in high school and early college. Mm-hmm. And the people and crowd that I was hanging out with, like, really was into it, and I was a fake... And so <laughs> you were a casual. So I was like, "Oh, I gotta, I gotta know about this." And and it was adventure, so it was like at least fun to read. Right. But hindsight on that is <laughs> the whole entity. Not a not a huge fan of it. Getting back to the Hellboy conversation, the the original first two, Benicio del Toro. Yes, the beloved Spaniard. Yes. Is that um, what that name translates to? Yes. Yes, I think oh. directly. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> direct <laughs> direct uh, <laughs> translation. I thought they were now. Granted, I'm a huge Hellboy fan. I thought they were perfect. I loved them. I He used puppets instead of heavy CGI. He was... Ronald Perlman. He got Ronald Perlman, who is basically Hellboy anyway. Right. And I thought the, the makeup was on point. The story was good. I just... I, I loved the first two. There was supposed to be a third. Just so, so much that when I saw the first couple trailers for this new Hellboy movie, I was a little apprehensive. Why were you apprehensive about it? It went a, a little too much CG heavy. Mm-hmm. I thought the tone they were going for was more of a wise cracking like Suicide Squad Hellboy, just like, hey, I'm a demon. That's not really Hellboy. Like, he doesn't really want to be him. He has these, like, doubts of being a demon and that he wishes he was just a normal, everyday person. So, like, there's yeah. a lot of inner conflict there, and I didn't get a whole hell of a lot of that from the trailer. Yeah, they just, like, didn't treat the campiness of Hellboy right. Correct. And I thought, like, the humor in the first two Hellboy movies was spot on. Well, I'm still going to see it. I'm going to crack a tall boy of Takati. Uh, <laughs> in the theater? <laughs> head down to my theater. Yeah, I'm going to shake it up. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's... I, I, I'm going to wait nice for addition. the... I'm going to wait for the quietest part of the movie and then... <laughs> Ooh. I can't wait to be watching that movie with that guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. You're going to get a cell phone call? Yeah, I think I'm going to have my buddy call me while I'm in the theater. And then I'm going to say, hey, what's up, dude? No, nothing. In a movie. Yeah, just chilling. Oh, I think that's a great idea. You want me to do that? Yeah, I have no problem getting this podcast started. Should we just go ahead and do that? Oh, Sure. All right, cool. We'll do. Well, who was that? It was God. What do you want? Oh, what do you say? He wanted us to get this podcast started. 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 Hey. Thanks, God. All right, the first book we mentioned we were going to talk about today was Faithless Number 1. It is out on Boom Studios. Some very sexy covers. We are going to get into that later. This is written by Brian Azzarello, um, notable writer. He wrote 100 Bullets, pretty popular independent comic book. Uh, Batman Damned, which we covered. He's got a really popular run of Wonder Woman. So this is a serious writer to be taken seriously, you guys. He's actually married to Jill Thompson, which I didn't know. She is a comic book queen. Yes. Artist of the Sandman series. Yep. And does Beast of Burden. Ooh, yes, she did. Some great, great comic books that we really love. So what a power couple. Mm-hmm. Yikes. Uh, we also have art in here, which is To Die For from Maria Lovett. Beautiful. Oh, magnifique. The colors, fantastic as well. They set us up 
for a sweet, sweet ride just based on the cover, their names, and what we know about them as people. <laughs> but, <laughs> Already a high bar set. But, yeah, but Budget King, do you want to talk to us about what this comic book was actually about on the inside of the cover? Ooh, yeah. And we should say this cover, these they had some sexy covers for this Jesus one. Jesus Christ. So this may be the most uh, pornographic cover that I currently own. If you have a bagged, blacked out, poly bag version of this at your comic book shop, get it, <laughs> open it up in a windowless room with nobody else, <laughs> and prepare to be fucking shocked. So the way that I have to read my comic books on Wednesdays is in a car. <laughs> like by myself. Oh, and I was just like, every single person thinks I'm bang- uh, spanking it to porn right now. <laughs> well, I'm sure people don't really look at me in my car, but uh, anyway, I was alone and sad. <laughs> and had a very <laughs> sexy comic book As cover. one should be when looking at porn. <laughs> um the back of this comic book is uh, a quote that says, the way you make love is the way God will be with you. And I really thought that this comic Skittish. book... Skittish? Right? <laughs> I also thought the way that they graphically treated that quote, it looks like the headline for like a romantic comedy. Yeah. yeah. Or God friended me on Facebook or some <laughs> shit. I, I, I think that this comic book is a lot about sex, or at least has a lot of sex in it, but it has a great story as well. We essentially are following a witch, a witch that's trying to be a witch, who is going through her own sexual frustrations. Let's just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And it's a day in her life. So she runs into somebody that's kind of like a rock star of sorts, crazily enough, is going through a breakup, who that person eventually kills themselves, which I'm sure we'll talk about. And then they end up together as a little bit of a couple, or at least I don't... I am in a monogamous relationship, so I assume everybody you have sex with, you have to <laughs> yeah, be Yeah, I was going to say, uh, a couple. just because they fucked doesn't mean they're a couple. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I assume that they're going to get married in the next uh, in the next comic book. Well, considering the roller coaster ride they went on in a single day, I wouldn't be surprised if they get married Jesus like, tomorrow. Jesus Christ. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot going on, but there's also not a lot. This is... This a is day a, in the life of... This is a well-articulated... Two book. horny people. Answer me this, club. Yep. Does magic truly exist in this world, or is she just fascinated with runes and satanic symbolism? So I think yes, and she doesn't know that it has worked. That was kind of my interpretation okay. of what's happening. Like, it appears that they've had this completely chance encounter. Mm-hmm. And then this woman that she meets has all these crazy things happen and some, like, odd influence on the world around her. Right. That's making their day just completely insane. And so I think the satanic runes that she's toying with Mm -hmm. maybe actually worked, and she doesn't know it yet. I think you're right. And I think one point to that is um, when she's in the coffee shop making one of her drawings, a friend comes up to her and is asking her about it, and she says, well, Malcolm, do you want it to be money or sabotage? Both of sabotage and money happen later. She's able to scam some money out of somebody. Oh, my gosh, you're totally right. um, And she sabotages this lady's relationship, maybe, because this guy kills himself. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Oh, I don't know if she sabotaged the relationship. It seems like this woman has just an effect on people that turns them into these like pitiful creatures that just fawn over her. And there's all the paintings of her that she is a muse of sorts. Yes. And that people are infatuated by her. Mm-hmm. I think that's we get clued in on that, especially when her ex kills himself because she won't go back to him. Yeah. She she has all those paintings because they've painted them of her. And like people just keep mm-hmm. on giving her portraits of her. Which, you know... Is humble to just have a whole house full of paintings of yourself. I guess if you're confident enough to just take off your shirt and wear a bra the whole day, people are going to paint pictures of you. I guess. I just saw this thing on Snapchat about a college girl that gets on apps and just gets, like, people to pay for her, like, shit, like, Gucci bags and, like, rent just because she's hot. She doesn't even do any sexual favors. How do I get into that <laughs> I scam? literally had the same thing. I was like, "How the? F- I, why can't I do that? Yeah. That do you seems- like kind of fat guys that read comic books? It made Pay me feel rent. so old because I was like, how is that even a thought that occurs to a, to a person? Yeah. That that could be a way to make money. See, pre-internet, those people would just die, <laughs> I think, because, you know. Or maybe they're entrepreneurs. They they found an avenue to make money, and God damn it, they made money. Yeah, the world, I'm just mad because I can't the world fucking needs do it. Those people, I guess. You go, of course, because where will stupid people spend their money <laughs> on comic books? Ooh, zing! <laughs> exactly right. Self zing. <laughs> so speaking of comic books, mm-hmm. um, this comic book 
obviously super sexy sexual. Mm-hmm. There was a while ago that I, th- I think we would have taken a shot at this comic for being just like too porny about two women being in a relationship and getting naked and it's just for men to like ogle. Right. But there seems to be a turning tide in comic books where there's like a lot of positivity and sexual expression and different types of relationships and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I looked at this comic book through an entirely different lens than I think I would have looked at it five years ago. It starts with her masturbating and then she's not able to orgasm, I think is what we're led to believe. Right. Correct. Um, and I think it kind of does a lot of these nuancy sex things, like she's unsure if she wants to have a lesbian experience, and I think it writes it so well, and I think having a female uh, illustrator helps with that, that this seems more like a sex-positive book than, totally. it, than it does like a porny book. Totally. I, I feel like, agree. like what Mike D was saying, there has been this shift, especially in indie books about sex positivity, Female, um, ex- females expressing their sexuality more vividly than they had in the past. Like it's been kind of a a, a repressed culture that has now flourished due to social media uh, and avenues such as comic books and zines. Women have been able to express themselves uh, and their sexuality more openly, and I think we're getting a firsthand look at that in Faithless. So there's a lot of things that we obviously like about the book, but did we actually like? the comic and the story as a whole. I think it was uh, an acquired taste that upon reflection, I was like, I actually really like this book. Yeah. I think I like the characters. I like the story. I like its progressiveness in like how sex oriented it was in a way that I don't normally get sex. And I like that there's going to be a cult, like weird stuff in her figure. I think there's mystery to be found. Yeah. I had to sit with it for a little bit to decide I liked it. When I was reading through it, I thought this is sparse. I'm not sure I'm totally following the narrative or what I'm supposed to take away from it. The cover of the book, if you got the A cover, it's got a tagline, an erotic depiction of faith, sex, and the devil in the tradition of the divine comedy. Which Ooh, I could have lived without that. Sounded really up its own ass and pretentious, yeah. and I expected it to be a dialogue heavy, super uh, heady book. Heady's a good word for it. A really heady comic book. And that's not what I got. And if you got the cover B, which is a virgin cover, you kind of get a quick glimpse that there's going to be some demon shit. And that's where I had my issue. Not because I don't like demons, because should I really spoil the the true ending of this book? Go for it. So at the end, the two women are having their sexual experience together. And... (laughs) Also known as sex. (laughs) Yeah. So I I wanted to make it a little more elegant, you know? I I wanted to jazz it up. (laughs) Thank you. When they were dancing in the nude... Boning. The one woman turned into like a pile of slugs. And let me note, the person that could not have an orgasm did have an orgasm. So can she only... Get off by From slugs. a slug? Yeah. Ladies, you hear to, heard it here first. Just put a slug in your pants. <laughs> Cut that. Um, <laughs> so my, I, I kind of see maybe where they're going. Like there's a darker force here in this world that's kind of moving. She's been messing with like occultist symbols and all that through the entire book. But I kind of wanted this girl to just be a manipulative trust fund girl who bounces from person to person just to get what she needs from them and then leaves them in the dust. To have that weird kind of demon twist on it, off to get the next couple issues to Wait, see it, how they... you think she turned into a demon? I thought maybe she died. Like, that's going to be the end of her character? I, I thought she just, like, is like a slug little demon oh, thing. Oh, she's just showing her true form. Yeah. As, as demon-ness. You're, yeah. You're totally right. That's exactly what it is. Especially because each cover has her on the front, so why would they kill her yeah. in the first book? Yeah. So, you're totally right. So that's... Like, like I said, I did like the book. I'm like 80%, 85% there. But I just want to see where they take the um, demon shit. If the art wasn't so damn good, don't think I'd be picking up the this second artwork, issue. This artwork, the ooh, art was god fantastic. I I think I would have picked it up for how it treated sex in a comic book alone. Yeah. I think it, it 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 this moves the dial forward on comic books. In, I'd agree in its own little niche. That's we could, true. We could look back at it as like an important book that. Yeah. Uh, I think in the next five or ten years we're going to be seeing. Yeah, sure a hell of a lot more uber sex positive books. There's there's a lot of nerd culture that is getting really sex positive right now, but you don't see a lot of super popular 
books that support that sort of fandom, mm-hmm. at least on like your popular comic book shelves. And this is definitely one of one those of things, like an, in the vein of unnatural. Yes. I was just going to say that. Yeah. yeah. Like, holy shit. Those two, these two books are going to be like looked at as just like the weird turning point where it all like got better <laughs> as <Yeah>. far <laughs> as uh, expressing sexuality in comics. Uh, and folks, I can't stress this enough. If you get the cover that's polybagged in the all black bag, do not show it to anyone else. Take it to your private comic book hole, view the cover, and then immediately burn it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Greg, so uh, prudish. <laughs> I'm just joking around, but there's a fucking butthole. There is a butthole on the cover of this goddamn comic book. I've never seen that before in my you, life. You've never seen a butthole? One, yes. Two, not in a comic book. I have not seen a butthole on a comic book. That's true. This is... Gra- <laughs> it graphic. is vivid. Ooh, it is vivid. Yeah. I feel like an eight-year-old just like, oh, there's a butt. Yeah. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> well, I don't think they can up the ante too much for the second issue. Yeah, seriously. What, what's that variant going to be? I can top that, but yeah. we'll see. We'll see what they come out with next month. All right, our second featured comic book for this week is Fair Lady number one out on Image Comics. Shermer, Balboni, and Luis are bringing this to you. This is the same creative team that brought us Black Jack Ketchum. So mm-hmm. if you enjoyed that book, we'll serenade you. Black Jack Ketchum in your neighborhood. Tell him. Black Jack Ketchum, he's one cool dude. Black Jack Ketchum, he likes to juggle cats. Ow! Black Jack Ketchum, look at that fancy hat. I love it. Uh, yeah, that's for all you Black Jack Ketchum fans out there. If you haven't read Black Jack Ketchum, I guess you're not going to get the reference of this song. <laughs> yeah, I kind of spoiled it all for you. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so this book, um, I'll tell you right away the cover of it has Big Cat Man. Uh, Ooh, you don't call him that. But you don't want to call him a Big Cat Man. <laughs> this is true. He takes offense to being called a feline. But, I mean, he's really straight up got a tomcat face and a big burly body. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got a couple of bruisers here. He's got a... Garfield at CrossFit. <laughs> Holy fuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you nailed it. <laughs> I think that's our next zine. That is CrossFit Garfield. <laughs> CrossFit Garfield. Gives up lasagna and takes up keto. <laughs> yeah. Instead Kitty of keto. <laughs> Instead of what was the first book was Live in Large? I think for Garfield, yeah, yeah. we'll we'll do uh, Live in Swole instead. Oh yeah, <laughs> he's, he'll be a whole different type of big. <laughs> is the is the tagline for CrossFit Garfield? Oh my god, <laughs> whole different type. You of guys big. do not know what you're in for for ZineCon 2019. <laughs> Monday's lasagna day. <laughs> <laughs> it's just treat day. <laughs> treat day. Okay, so. This book features a couple private investigators. Like I mentioned, one of them is a big yellow cat man. Um, They're real bruisers. They look like tough asses. They'll kick your butt. So it seems like they kind of take on crimes that are below the law. Like they have like a special license for their investigations and they take like small pithy crimes. Much like a private investigator would. Yeah, I don't know why I'm, like, saying that they're this, like, unique made-up thing, because that's what a private investigator I think so. is. I don't, I don't know for a fact, but that my assumption is I that. Think, what they I think since this is set in a fantasy world, I'm explaining this job like it's sci-fi fiction, but it <laughs> isn't. It's a real job. So they're just P.I.s. Um, the first issue specifically, they trail a woman who skips out on a debt, yep. and then they encounter... Other PIs that are after the same woman Mm -hmm. who've been hired by different debtors who are all after, you know, the same person. So they kind of get into some squabbles there, which made for kind of an interesting story. Yeah, yeah. What did you guys think of this first book? When I read the back quote of how he pitched this as um, if the Hobbits watched a detective show. Right, yeah. I was like, oh, I get it. And, yeah. I, and I like it. He's, I think it was like a Columbo for Middle Earth or yeah. something. Like it was Magnum P.I. Magnum P.I. Uh, yeah. I, that description, I was like, that's exactly what this fucking is. 100%. You could have taken them out of fairy tale land and put this in a sort of reality-based world. Yep. And you wouldn't give it a second thought. The other thing is this is called Fair Lady, and this lady kicks ass. She is a strong lead. She's, like, fun to watch. Um, but she's doing, like, just as much of the bruising as uh, CrossFit Garfield is. Right. It, so I guess we should explain what Fair Lady is. 
So she kind of Mulan's the situation. There's these things called fair men, right? Mm-hmm. And they're basically soldiers in an army. And she wanted to be a soldier, so she snuck in. Are you explaining the premise of Mulan? In this book. Oh. Because this is how she got started. And so she did I so didn't well. I this. So she had a pet dragon. Okay, keep continuing. Yeah, pet dragon voiced by Eddie Murphy. Okay. And Murphy? <laughs> Murphy. <laughs> Murphy, me. <laughs> <laughs> and so she did so well in the war that uh, a wizard hired her to uh, be her fair lady. Let's get down to business with Dude, my cat, feet. the Huns. Garfield. Oh, sorry, different song. <laughs> so she's basically just like a, oh, that hired bad. security, but like on such a badass level. Yeah, and I think we're led to believe, too, that she might have been a little discriminated against that she found herself as a PI because she was a woman mm, and otherwise yeah. would have been like maybe a political leader or would have ascended to a higher role, but right. instead she's, she's taken these pithy crimes. This book doesn't take itself too seriously, but it is 30 pages of packed story. Yeah, it was dense, wasn't it? We got a lot of origin in this. And, and they, they promised to do yeah. 30 pages every time. Which is awesome. The book's only $4. You got a big value burger here. <laughs> and this guy promises to give you value burgers every month. Poof. To your face. Okay, so it seems like we liked the P.I. story as a whole. What do you think about the world that they created for it? Little confusing. Yeah. Don't it, they jump around a lot? There is maps. Caitlin would love that. Mm-hmm. Um, I need to go back and like look at it a little bit. But I'm not one to kind of get tripped up on that. I still the story was good enough. Yeah, I think they gave me enough information in the beginning. It's just like there was a war here. It was fought. Now the war is over. Yeah. Well, and it's back to kind of peaceful times. There well, are Garfield people. And we'll we'll learn more about the world over the course of the next few issues, probably. Yeah. I'll tell you what I really did enjoy about this book. Yeah. Start to finish, you get one story. There's no cliffhanger. There's no things untied. You get one concise story in the book. Vintage comic books, oh, baby. I loved it. There's no bait and switch. There's no, like, hooking you for the second issue. You get one fucking story in the book. And, that, and then it's done. That is, yeah. Not often done. They they said uh, a little bit a la Hellboy. Used to do that a little bit. Yeah, exactly. So, like, I feel like these books are just going to be different case files. Which works good for, like, a P.I. serialized yeah, sort of Yeah, for sure. Thing. Totally. Yeah. So, I, that's what I really loved about it because, uh, let's say you fall off a couple of issues, you're not going to be too confused when you come back and... Imagine you, if all your favorite books were like that. That would be that amazing. Batman just, would be out of Occasionally business. just grab a book and be like, what's Batman up to now? Ugh. <laughs> Everything would be super accessible and we wouldn't have to do this podcast. Yeah, they would fire us. <laughs> oh, what <laughs> yeah, a totally. Stop being millionaires. Uh-huh. <laughs> you could just jump into anything at any given time. There'd be no reason for Marvel to put number one on everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All these mattress <laughs> they companies number, that want to do number whatever you commercials want. with us. Yeah, number, <laughs> number one for fun. I don't know. What a, what a perfect world that would be. Okay, one of the world building things that I really liked about Fair Lady was that this town that they were living in kind of exist within the ruins of a giant. That was some great art. Yeah, like a, like a robot? I, it looked robotic, right? And it was huge. And it had kind of sunken into the ground and deteriorated, but it made a nice like wall mm-hmm. and shade around this area. So they had like different parts of town. If you like picture Manhattan, but it's encased by like a <laughs> colossal <laughs> robot. Yeah. And who's to say Manhattan isn't a giant robot? We don't know. <laughs> That's Could a good point, be. actually. I also love this like little map they did to sh- set up the crime scene. Yeah. Uh, where they showed all these different things that were in the room. And it kind of works a lot like a video game. Like they come back to a lot of these references, um, some of the poetry that she's writing and then a rock that they take later on. So it was interesting. Yeah, any good PI thing, it's like really cool to visually show the things that like they would notice and yes. kind of explain what that says about a person. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, it's like a common thing you see in TV, but to see it executed in a comic book this way is really interesting. Should we talk about the good luck charm that they found, which was a human skull or like a fragment of a That's human the skull? Rock that I yeah I miscalled a rock. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. But it is a shrunken skull. Okay, oh, Budget King, I did know what you were saying. Thank you. I didn't because so not, we you don't were need, wrong. We don't need to correct it then. Oh, get into, you already said you were wrong. Get into so. this tedious correction, Greg. What was the rock? <laughs> Explain that, please. 
Uh, if you would to our listeners. So in the previous war that I had mentioned <laughs> uh, earlier in the book, uh, <laughs> there was a catastrophe that happened that leveled not only soldiers but civilians and their heads and skeletons turned into like these weird rock-like keepsakes that people collect as like good luck charms for some sadistic reason. So that's all I got. So That was confusing to me as a, as a human. Once you've listened to this episode, hashtag rock conversation, and tell us if you thought that that helped uh, your listening experience Fuck. today. <laughs> just rock, hashtag rock conversation, yes. Hashtag rock conversation, no. No. You just, no. Okay, so you've made it too long. It's hashtag rock talk. Rock talk. There we go. <laughs> rock conversation. People are going to dip out before they even finish typing conversation. And so they're just telling you if Greg's little um, aside on the rock was yes. helpful or not? Yeah. Okay. Did that, yeah. Does that make this synopsis of this book and our discussion about it better? Well, you heard it here first. Hashtag rock talk. Rock talk. Find me on Twitter. <laughs> Tell me I was right. Please validate me because talk- these two schmucks <laughs> we talked about a rock are hey, dunking. And we want I know you don't pay anything for this podcast, but we still want you to have the best experience possible. <laughs> so be honest. <laughs> be honest on hashtag rock talk. God damn it. <laughs> Been a great time sitting with you fellas and chatting about these first issues. <laughs> I can't wait to go talk about Faithless again. Yeah, we're going to be on our buddy's YouTube show later on. White Whale Comics. White Whale Comics, talking about that. Um, Faithless. If we, this is going to be out by the time that that has aired and is gone, so you missed it, sucker. Does this live live out on YouTube? Yeah. So if you want to see what we look like while we're having this conversation, <laughs> go back and look at uh, follow White Whale Comics on Instagram. And we're actually going to recreate the cover of Faithless <laughs> with on, my butthole on YouTube Live. I don't think they can censor that. So, Not if it's quick enough. Yeah. <laughs> so if if you've ever wondered, your butthole thought, wouldn't get censored anyway. I think. It yeah. Looks too. Well, I got pill worms, normal. so it might be censored anyway. <laughs> Ooh, worm worms are the only thing that make me orgasm. Well, god damn it. Way to call back to the comic. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay, now we've made it such an awkward exit. Anyway. Well, I can't wait to be awkward again next week on First Issue Club. Bye. Sorry, Mom. And Mike for saying bye. Oh, fuck. I did it. <laughs> that was fine. This has been another episode of First Issue Club. We are a proud member of the Fountain City Frequency family of podcasts. Our music is provided by Primary Color Music. We are recorded in KCUR Studios. You can find us, rate us, friend, and follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, email, and your favorite listening platforms at First Issue Club, F-I-R-S-T. Look at that.